I know, huh? So, facts about the Bible. The first fact about the Bible. Hello! When I start talking, everybody else stops talking. Thank you. The Bible is a gift God wished men to have. The first fact about the Bible. The, the human authors of the various biblical books were actual living men of a most fascinating variety of character. For those of you who were here on the Feast of St. Luke at my Mass, you heard the history of St. Luke, who was an absolutely fascinating character, as they all were. They, um, it's hard for us to think of these. We, we see their works, you know, and we don't think of the people behind them. But what an interesting bunch of people the authors of scripture were. Um, Matthew was a civil servant. Mark was Peter's secretary. Peter himself, formerly a fisherman. Paul, a former Pharisee, and his secretary, Luke, a physician. John, the son of thunder, yet the beloved disciple. Job, King David, etc. Um, yeah, an interesting thing about St. Luke too, he was a physician and most likely a slave. Uh, in those days, wealthy families who had slaves would often send one of them away to medical school so they would have their own family doctor. And so it has been uh, speculated over the millennia that Luke began as a slave was, and became a physician in that uh, context, which makes it all the more interesting. St. Patrick was a slave. Um, you know, I'm sure there were a lot of saints that were probably slaves at some point or another. The Bible contains an account of God's relations with men and tells us much about what we would otherwise be in ignorance of. The Old Testament explains how man came to need a savior and how God prepared the world for his coming. The New Testament tells us of the Savior's coming, the completion of his work, and the founding of a church to make available to men all that he had won for them. In the New Testament, we have an intimate picture of Christ drawn by those who knew him and loved him best. Apart from this, we know little of his life. Therefore, as St. Jerome said, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. So it would be a shame if our, our knowledge of scripture were limited to just what we heard at mass on Sunday. That would be, you know, almost unforgivable because there's so much to it. And, and um, you know, when we talk about the Bible, it's not, it's not a book like a novel, you know, that you would pick up and you read and okay, here's, here, I mean, yeah, it does have an introduction when, God created the world and everything. But it doesn't have, like a novel does, you know, a plot and various things like that, although you can say it does have a plot in a way. It's a collection of books that are the word of God and they're on various things. There is history, there's poetry, there are dietary rules, there are instructions, there instructions for priests, there are instructions for regular people, there's accounts of this, there's um, spiritual reading, exhortation to be more spiritual and, and, and whatever. Those are all in, in fact, I mean, I don't, it, it, you might call me like impious or a heretic, but there are actually large part of scripture that don't apply to us at all. You know, there's this notion that, oh, oh, oh Lord, I'm having a problem. So, okay, show the Lord, and, and we go, oh yes, I see, thou shalt not eat of any unclean bird. <laughs> yeah, Lord, what do you mean by that? <laughs> okay, so it doesn't all apply. And the parts that were written for our benefit were not written by 21st century Americans to 21st century Americans. They were written by people in their context. And to fully understand as much as we can the Word of God, there, there's a lot of homework that we would have to do. What's, a good thing is to get something like the Haydock Bible. Um, the Haydock Bible 
is, is a really, really good Bible to have. It's the, it's the Douay Rheims, it's not a different Bible. But it's called the Hadark because they put together, Hadark put together commentary from the fathers of the church and different sources. So a lot of pages will have that much scripture and that much commentary on it. And if there's something to be said about, about a particular line of scripture, down, like you read this and, and down below you see verse 16 and it says, da la 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 la. And it makes the experience of reading the scripture much, much greater than had we just read it without the commentary. So one thing I strongly suggest is the Hadoch Bible or some other commentary. Um, there, are ver there are various very good commentaries on the scripture, which are usually not just by one person, but are compilations of all the great commentaries of scripture um, from St. Augustine down through um, Bellarmine and, and even later. Okay. So we wanna know the context of what we're reading, what, what it meant, are there any interpretations of what things meant there? Um, things can go very crazy when you stray from the church. Like, there are other um, groups, you know, as I call them, that will say, well, uh, you know, you Catholics teach that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are equal. They are three persons in one God and each of them, them completely possesses the divinity. They don't share the divinity, so they're all equal. And then it says clearly right here, Jesus says, for the Father is greater than I. Well, you're all wet now, aren't you? Well, no, you have to see what did, what did he mean by that? You know, what, 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 he, what, was, the, what was the context? And what is the interpretation? Because clearly, it can't mean that the three persons of the Trinity are not equal, but in which way is the Father then, um, in, in that way that Christ means it, greater than him? But certainly not as, as concerns the divinity itself. So you want to know any of these, the, anytime there's a, a passage like that, what the interpretation of that actually is. But we should spend time. Um, you know, some people, say, well, okay, this Lent, I'm going to read the entire Bible. I don't really recommend doing that because you get stuck in Deuteronomy or the Book of Numbers or, you know, this kind of thing, and pretty soon you lose your taste for Scripture. I, I would say maybe read the New Testament um, or read certain books of the Old Testament, Genesis, uh, Isaiah, or these kinds of things. But promising that you're going to read the Bible from beginning, yeah, certainly familiarize with yourself with it. Look through the chapters that are, you know, don't seem very applicable in our day and age, just to know what's there. Uh, it's some, but, but we all should definitely be reading the books of the New Testament thoroughly from beginning to end. Um, we can only do so much in church, you know, and it's interesting the way the readings were chosen. You know, we have a one-year cycle of our bi uh, the biblical readings that we use for the masses. Every year, then at the end of the year, we go back and we start over with the same readings. The Novus Ordo used a three-year cycle. Um, and their, their notion was, well, we want to expose people to a greater uh, variety of scriptures over three years. But actually they did psychological studies and they find that the one year cycle is actually the best for people remembering what's in those. So in a three year cycle, you'll get exposed to a greater number of scriptures perhaps, but you won't re remember them. Traditional Catholics, as they hear the same things on the same days and same feasts, year in and year out, they at least have certain scriptures that they really know well. And Psychologists have shown that that is actually better for, for remembering. So that's what we do. But you realize that in the course of a, a one year cycle or even a three year cycle, you don't get anything like the whole New Testament even, let alone the Old Testament, uh, over that course. And it all should be read. There are many, many beautiful, beautiful things in, you know, to, to be found in Scripture. So, 
you might want to take it up. Advent's coming around, you know. Start with uh, Matthew, you know. Um, then later on Lent, we'll have other opportunities where you, you know, you should be doing your spiritual reading a little bit all the time, but if there are certain seasons that you want to specifically donate to the, or dedicate to this, then those are good, Advent and Lent. Um, but you, we should all be familiarizing ourselves with Scripture. And, and why? Well, so for our, you know, to grow, grow closer to Christ and, his, you know, and the church. Um, also, though, it, you know, it, it's no good to be ignorant of Scripture because then you become a victim, you know, um, or be ignorant of the faith in general. You should know what's in Scripture. You should know what the content of the faith is. You know, the, um, like, take, like, the, the poor Mexicans. Like, they're, they weren't taught their faith. They don't know it. They didn't learn it. And so the Jehovah's Witnesses come by, and they go, well, you were being lied to by the Catholic Church. They lied to you. Look at what it says in the Bible. And they take and they pervert parts of Scripture to convince them that they need to become a Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witnesses are demons. They are demons, demons, demons. They are the worst of the worst. I would rather have uh, a, a Lutheran or a Mormon as a, you know, a bedfellow any day of the week rather than a Jehovah's Witness. Because some other people are Maybe they don't have the fullness of the truth, but they're not demonic. Jehovah's Witnesses are demonic. They, they specifically signal out like Mexicans, in my area anyway, who don't know their faith to steal their souls for the devil. And if these people had known their faith and known the scripture, they wouldn't have fallen for it. Okay? So that's another reason you should, you should know what's in there. So when one of these guys says to you, well, this, you go, oh, that's not what that says. Yeah. Um, besides things like this, do they have lots of opportunities for laymen to take university level Catholic theological studies? There are at Catholic college, like, um, the closest to here is uh, St. Thomas Aquinas College up just this side of Santa Barbara. I forget the exact city it's in. Santa uh, Paula. It, what? Santa Paula. Santa Paula. They have a good, they have a good program for that. And um, they have people from all, all over the place coming there to study just those things. We can't recommend today the same places that we used to recommend. You know, it used to be you could go to Notre Dame, you know, and, and learn great stuff. But the stuff they're teaching there is pretty bad now. But there are still places, uh, I think, doctrinally at least, you could go, it, Thomas Aquinas, um, Ave Maria University in Florida. There's still a few places. Uh, St. Mary's College, Kansas. Are there some online? You know, I haven't heard of any serious one online. Um, fa uh, Father, Dr. Tom Trulesky had started something like that, but then kind of blew it out of the water at some point. And, yeah, it's pretty much gone. That's a good question because, yeah, so people who want to do that become uh, theologians or professional catechists really should should have a place to go for things like that. All right. So, um, texts and versions. <laughs> You know, I know what a text is, I do it all the time, but what's a version? <laughs> the official text of the Bible used by the Catholic Church is known as the Latin Vulgate. And, like I said, funnily enough, by some quirk, that was as true in 1951 or whatever this thing came out as it is now. Because the Church has had it as its official Bible for many centuries and never changed that. Probably because there weren't too many others they could really pick, I suppose, to, to be that. So, the Latin Vulgate, um, and Vulgate means, the, it, it comes from a Latin word, vulgus, which means common. Um, 
it, and it meant it was for the common man basically to read. And at the time, the, Vol the, the way the Vulgate came about was uh, the Pope was looking for a good, readable, up-to-date version of the Bible that could be read in the Roman Empire at the time. And their, Latin, their, their language at the time was Latin, so he wanted a good Latin translation done of the original books. So they picked St. Jerome, and who was one of the greatest biblical scholars of all time, and he did the authentic version that we now call the Vulgate. Now a couple things to know about St. Jerome and the Vulgate is, first of all, he spoke all of the languages that in scripture, um, except for uh, Hebrew, which he got a ra rabbi to teach him those parts that were Hebrew, and Chaldean. Um, now he had originally farmed out one of the book that was in, I think his book of Daniel was written in Chaldean. And he had farmed it out to somebody else then he had qualms of conscience, he went off, learned Chaldean, and came back and did his own. But now, where we talk about St. Jerome doing the translation we know as the Vulgate, the Latin, um, there was a, there, a, a Latin translation of scripture done well before that. And this was called the Itala. Really, St. Jerome, what he did was took the original books of the Bible, looked back and forth, and kind of made corrections on the Itala. So his work was largely done for him in most cases. Um, but it's, it's a very interesting tribute to the, the ancient nature of the traditional Latin Mass. Because at certain times of the year, you will notice particularly in introits and other, other things, but particularly in the introits, there are uh, well, you wouldn't notice, I guess. I would notice. <laughs> okay, I have noticed, let's change this, that there are variations to psalms I know from the Vulgate, or quotes I know from the Vulgate. And I go, well, why is this? As it turns out, there, there are um, still texts from the Itala predating the fourth century in the Roman Missal. And they're just relics, just little pieces of them. But every so often they pop up, and it's gone. Oh, you know, because when you say the breviary, you you know all the psalms kind of. You know, if you haven't got them memorized, you at least kind of know the flow of them and how they how they go. And when, then you'll get this quote that's just a little off, maybe sometimes one word, and it, and it just causes you. Oh, yeah. And then, but the answer for that is, I tell it. That was already in the Roman Missal by the time Saint Jerome did his translation of Scripture in towards the end of the 300s. That's just a fact. What is fact, please? If you win a trivia show contest, you, you owe 10% to the church. <laughs> <laughs> so we have this Vulgate then translate. Oh, another thing about it is um, Pope, Pope St. Damasus, so imagine a saint asking another saint, <laughs> those were the days, right, to do translation. When he asked him to do that, he gave him what he had, which we speculate from the nature of things, probably contained some of the autographed, autographed versions of scripture, you know, autograph, the original penned version of some of the New Testament books, if not even some of the old ones, but some of, at least some of the New Testament ones. So St. Jerome had what came from the pens of some of the New Testament writers in front of him when he made this translation. Um, and so really it doesn't, it doesn't get any better than that. Uh, and his, he did the very best possible translation into, so even when the Bible came into existence at the, in the fourth century, the Pope wanted people to be able to read it. It was one of the first things that happened after the church compiled the Bible was to have it translated into the language that people spoke, you know, the, the, the Latin of the day. Now, the Latin of the day is 
different from the Latin of previous centuries. Uh, much to my chagrin. I say, so I had four years of Latin in high school, Latin and Greek, and then I took four years in college. And all of a sudden, everything was kind of wrong when I went to college. Why? Because I took Latin and Greek from Father Joe Geary, who was a Jesuit of the finest type from the old days. And he spoke church Latin. When I went to uh, college, it was classical Latin. So what's classical Latin is from the very early part of the Roman Empire. When they were, when they more or less began, they were all speaking Latin. But it's kind of like now, you know, um, and there's about as much time difference too. If you take a, a, a college English class, one of the things you will be subjected to is the writings of Geoffrey Chaucer, okay? From like the Canterbury Tales, for example. Bawdy little books that somehow make their way into every college English class and probably shouldn't because of their content, but there they are. Like, don't read the Miller's Tale, for example. You now let's get the Miller's Tale, look it up in line. Okay, there, um, Geoffrey Chaucer was no saint and he wrote these, wrote these relatively bawdy little tales called the Canterbury Tales. You can't read them. This is, they're written in quote unquote English, but you can't read it. Uh, no more than if you handed um, one of the works of the uh, of Plato in the, his Greek to a Greek today, you know. So from the beginning of Latin in the Roman Empire to the end of Latin in the Roman Empire, we have that same difference. Not only that, but a difference in pronunciation. So if you read Cicero, for example, or um, Julius Caesar, we had to read in college, and we had to read the history of the Gallic Wars in classical Latin. Okay, so we have, I'll show you the difference, and there's pronunciation books. We have um, in Latin, salve regina, mater misericordiae, vita dulcedo, et spes nostra salve. Okay? Okay. That is church life. Class life. Salve regina, mater misericordia, vita dulcedo, et spes nostra salve. I know, it sounds like you have a speech in the head. And you know, veni, vidi, vici becomes weedy, weedy, weedy. <laughs> Although he probably did say weeny, weedy, weedy, which makes it sound like Albert Fudd was conquering the Roman Empire. <laughs> the Latin that we use in the church is a Latin frozen in time at the end of the fourth century. It's called decadent Latin, not because it contains huge amounts of cream and dark chocolate, <laughs> which would be nice, but it's because it comes from the decaying part when the Roman Empire was decaying. So what church Latin is what they call decadent Latin. And when the Roman Empire fell apart, they didn't use Latin anymore except in universities and scholarly places. It was used in, math, in church, obviously church, universities, that was the language of university. So it became kind of frozen in time. Anyway, the Vulgate is decadent Latin, the, La the common Latin of the decay of the, the Roman Empire. And that's what we use to this day. So, uh, he was the greatest scripture scholar of his day, and I have to add probably, you know, in, in running for the greatest scriptural scholar of, of all time, really. He was just, just phenomenal. Um, Pope, when Saint Pope, Pope Saint Damasus asked him to translate the Bible, he used for the work all the best Hebrew and Greek manuscripts then available, many of which have since been lost to history. The English Douay Reims version and the new version by Monsignor Ronald Knox are translations from the Vulgate. So the English fleeing um, Henry VIII went over to France and they went to two cities, Douai and Reims. Mm -hmm. And there they worked on trans translation into English of the scripture. Now, once again, um, 
remember that, why did they do this? So that English speaking people could read scriptures. When did they do it? Before the King James Bible. Um, the Protestants would have you think that the King, the King James Bible was you know, the first translation releasing scripture to all English speakers and then the Catholic Church tried to play catch up and did theirs later. It was the other one around. It precedes the um, King James. And, uh, oh, okay, so it was somewhat of a slavishly accurate translation from the Vulgate. In Latin, as you might realize, um, the verbs are in different places, the subjects are in different places. If you went word for word from Latin, it, it would sound a little stilted, okay? And the original Douay Rheims is, is a little bit stilted. Uh, later on, Bishop Challoner tried to fix that and put it into a more readable. So we have what we, the, the Vulgate we use now, uh, not the Vulgate, the uh, Douay Rheims that we use, for example, for the readings from the pulpit, are the Challoner fix up of the Douay Rams. Okay? And it was a good thing. Don't, don't think it was, a lot of people go, well, that's not the authentic Douay Rams. Well, it is, it's just, it's just put, they rearrange the verb in where we use it in English normally and the subject over there and the predicate over there. And so it flows for an English speaker, okay? Um, Monsignor Knox later on, I think he was in the 50s or 40s, I don't remember when. He, I remember using the Knox translation when I lived in Ireland. And he did the same thing. He took the Vulgate and did a, an even more modern English translation from that. There were certain problems. Um, there were, there was this, there's a line in one of the Psalms about, I lie in bed at night and, and I, um, you know, I cry, at, I cry tears at night in my bed, okay? Well, the Knox translation says, every night I wet my bed. <laughs> <laughs> which may be good according to the law, I, I don't know. <laughs> but we always laugh when we put there. Thou shalt kill. What's that? Thou shalt kill. Thou shalt kill. <laughs> and little mistakes like that. Um, so that's where Knox comes in. Now, the Westminster version, so other groups got the um, most authentic original language versions of scripture as they could get and then made translations into English directly from those without going through the Vulgate. Now, in one sense, it seems to make some sense because you go, well, the, Vul the Douay Rheims would be a translation of a translation and that's like playing post office a lot of times. Um, but the Westminster version is a translation from the original. The problem is, which original? The ones we have that are called the originals in Greek now, or whatever language we're using, um, there's a variety of them, and we don't actually know 100% which of those is the closest to the original. So as it turns out, the translation of a translation is probably as good or better than a translation of an original that we're not sure is 100% original. <coughs> So I suppose you could go either way on that. The church has come down on the side of, we'll stick with the translation, which is the, the Vulgate. So did, when Vatican II came around, did the church do away with the Vulgate? Oh, yeah, yeah. In fact, um, if you go into a Catholic bookstore now, they have all the, they really have King James Bibles and things like that with a Catholic stamp on them. They want it to be ecumenical. So. And some were horrible. I mean, they even were worse than that. There was one called the Good News Bible, which was, we used to call just the Bad News Bible. Um, uh, we had that in high school. It was just garbage. You see, what that was, was not a real translation translation. That was a paraphrasing. So they would look at several lines and go, okay, well, this is what it means. And they'll give a nice little one-liner to paraphrase. But it ends up being just not good, not good scripture, not good scholarship. Anyway. I heard even uh, on the NIV version, um, one of the members of the board, um, they had the NIV version, and they said that the Vulgate was the 
Well, I mean, that's not going to change his translation, hopefully, but, you know, he might edit out a few parts. But, um, yeah. So, okay. Um, in the Catholic Bible, the Old Testament is based on the Septuagint, a Greek version made by 70 translators, um, 70 being Septuaginta, translators at Alexandria for the Jews who mostly spoke Greek. Um, now, it, it's kind of interesting. The Remember I told you that if divine inspiration meant simply that God, you know, the, the writer fell into a trance while holding a pen and God went like this with his hand and wrote out, all the Gospels would be the same, essentially. Well, actually something like that happened with the Septuagint, um, which is actually proof of it being a divinely inspired translation. A lot of the Jews had settled in the part of Egypt we know as Alexandria. And they were want, and they, but they spoke Greek. And they were wanting a translation of the Old Testament for themselves to read that was in their, their new native common language. And so a, a, a work was commissioned and it was the, the job of translating was given to 70 biblical experts, scholars, kind of people. And so the, the story goes, okay, don't shoot the messenger. But the story goes that they each did a translation of the scripture of the Old Testament. And when they brought, they all came back together to show their notes that they were all identical. That it was like God did that. So, um, now that's far from dogma, but that's, that's the story of how, you know, that surrounds the, te- the Septuagint. The interesting thing though about the Septuagint is that not only does it contain all the books of the Bible, the ones that were rejected, even the ones rejected by Luther and those guys later on. But Christ, whenever he quoted scripture, quoted the Septuagint, which contained all the books. Now, I'm not too clear to tell you that I should find this out as to whether he, did he actually quote books that were deleted from the Septuagint later on, but he did, whenever he quoted it, was that translation of scripture that he quoted. Yeah. And it's many, many times in the book I remember that he quoted, but he quoted the Sarah. Oh. I don't have that. So I've said that all the time. Of course, she didn't respond. But you can get it online. Well, send it to me. I'd like to see that. Okay, so we have it on the um, authority of Michelle that she's looked this up. And uh, she said that actually Jesus does quote the book of Sirach which is one of the books thrown out of scripture. So if that's, that's the case then. I looked yeah. it up too. Yeah. Is, it, it, is that the only one? Uh, I think this is one reference that Jesus makes. Okay. Right. Yeah. A couple more maybe. Um, and, and this is important too because it shows a couple things. That the Septuagint was widely disseminated. You know, that it was used by Jews in general all over the Roman Empire at this point and that uh, it was the Bible that our Lord chose to use. Not only that, the reason why he chose to use it, I mean, he wrote it after all, but the reason why he chose to use it is that it was the Bible that that was used at the temple, the Bible that the Pharisees and scribes and everybody were using, and they, they accepted. It was the accepted translation of Scripture. So... Um, then it is important to, to understand that this translation was accepted by the Jews as being divinely inspired and, and containing everything that it was supposed to contain at the time. Okay, just a couple more things here. Um, okay, Septuagint. Uh, it was begun about 280 years before Christ and was completed in the next century. All Jews acknowledge it to be authentic, acknowledged it to be authentic, and it was used by Christ and the apostles. 300 of the 350 quotations from the Old Testament found in the New Testament are taken directly from the Greek Septuagint. 
There are 73 books in the Catholic Bible, 46 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. Through anti-Catholic prejudice, the early Protestants repudiated the Septuagint and thus omitted from their translation the book of Tobias, Judith, Wisdom, Ecclesiasticus, and Baruch, and later 1st and 2nd Maccabees, plus sections of Esther and Daniel. That is why these books are not in the Protestant authorized versions. But the early Christians, with Christ and his apostles, certainly accepted these books, frequently quoting and alluding to them in their writings. I think I'll stop there because, um, and we'll continue the next time with the Bible is not the only rule of faith. Uh, one thing here, if you have anything to be blessed, anybody has brought anything they want me to bless, bring it up here now, and I'll bless everything at once. Um, and then that's it. I said what? The Father is pure spirit.